Welcome, family and friends. Uh, it's a privilege to be together with you once again, uh, reading and sharing on the book of Revelation. And we've already had some great feedback from, from those of you who have never studied this book or never read this book. So we're so glad that it's been a blessing to you. And uh, yesterday we started with chapter one, and today we're going to do chapter two. And uh, we're excited about what God has in store for us and what he wants us to learn and to hear and as we said before uh, we're not any experts we're just going to be sharing what we've been learning and what God's been showing us and we invite you to also listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you uh, through what we're going to be uh, reading and talking about. Should yes. we pray? Yes. Please. Are you ready first? So no, say hi. you can pray. Let's, let's <laughs> pray and thank the Lord. Father we, we give this time to you, we dedicate this time to you as a time that you would speak to us through your spirit. We submit to your leading. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you guide us in all truth. And, uh, and we ask that it would be so as we read and study this wonderful book um, through which you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're going to be starting with chapter 2, Adele. Yes, and today we are going to do the, the four churches. You know, there's seven. We will put the map on again so that you can see the different churches. So we will be doing Ephesus, Smyrna, um, per Pergamum, and Theatira. Ne? That's the four churches that we will do today. And on the map, you can see where it is. It was physical places, and it was cities. And he wrote to the letters to the church, one church of all the congregation in that city. So, okay, so we start reading chapter 2. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. That is what we did. What we did yesterday, you know, the, that picture of Jesus walking among uh, these uh, seven churches, and that's the vision that John saw. But interesting, Adele, this uh, thing, the, the letter to the angel of the church, and you're wondering, is it like an angel that received a letter from John? Um, this word can actually also be translated as messenger. And so it's very logical to conclude that um, John was writing this letter from the Lord Jesus. Uh, remember, it's, it's Jesus telling the angel to tell John to write the letter to the churches, and he writes it to the angel, which in this case means the leader, or the convener of the church, the one who is responsible for the church. Because we read in chapter 1 yesterday that whenever they read this message, um, they would be blessed. And so they're writing this message to the leader so that he can read to the body of Christ within that city what Jesus is writing to them. Uh, verse 2, we are going on. It says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate the evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without witting. But then, this is where it gets to. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, if you don't repent, I'm going to say it a third time. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. This is such a beautiful letter and there is actually a couple of things that we can already begin to uh, talk about when he writes to this specific church. Now, for those of you who would remember... Um, Ephesus sounds very familiar, right? Because Paul actually wrote a letter to the Ephesians. Uh, that means to the people who were living in Ephesus. And that was because Ephesus had a very uh, strong, powerful church uh, in the times of the apostles. 
we read in Acts chapter 19 that uh, Paul went there and he ministered so powerfully through the power of the Holy Spirit that people publicly burnt um, their books of witchcraft. And uh, I mean, can you imagine? And they said that the pile, uh, the value was like millions of dollars worth of books because you remember at that time, books and scrolls were very expensive items. And, uh, and, and so these witchcraft books were burnt publicly. People publicly came and said, I don't want to serve this anymore. I don't want to read this anymore. I'm burning it because I'm dedicating my life uh, to Jesus. And it became so, uh, so harmful to the city's, um, you know, previous spirituality. Um, because in that city, there were a lot of idol worship. Uh, there was a specific temple that was uh, uh, built uh, in honor of Diana of the Ephesians. Um, she was called the Queen of Heaven. And, and also Artemis is a, another name for, for that goddess. And so many people came to Christ that the those who were making idols, who were making selling, the statues, yo, at the shops, no, yeah, they had shops to 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 sell these small statuettes of Diana or of the or temple, Arthur. you know, um, became furious because their business was going down the drain. People, yeah, were, money, yeah. people no longer bought the statues because everyone was following Jesus. I mean, can you imagine how powerful that that was? Um, that that those who were who were doing evil were were going out of business, <laughs> and they became yeah. angry with Paul and his his uh, followers. Uh, they dr they wanted to you know they 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 incited a mob. Um, there was a public hearing. You can go read it in Acts nineteen. But in the end, nothing happened, and uh, and Paul could go on with his ministry. And then from there on, he actually went to another city, chapter twenty. But interestingly enough. After that incident, uh, John, the apostle, also went there. And interesting, uh, I read it out that, that John actually stayed there and died there. They, yeah, they yeah, said yeah. that was the last yeah. place he lived. After he came from Patmos. Right? After he came from Patmos. So, um, so John was, one of, was, like Adele said yesterday, the last apostle that remained alive. He died of, um, of natural causes, of old age. And when he came into Ephesus... Um, he actually went into the temple of Diana, uh, something that Paul n uh, didn't do. And he then rebuked and spoke against this spirit, this evil spirit that was reigning over the city and wanted to reign over the city. And it said that half of the temple actually collapsed. So it was a, it was a powerful demonstration of God's spirit uh, through, the, through the life of, of Paul, but also through the life of John. And so this church was a powerful church, right? And, um, and, and now all of a sudden, the Lord says to me, to them, you haven't loved me the way you first did, right? They had lost their way spiritually. They were no longer in love with Jesus. They did things, you know, to be seen maybe because it says you're actually doing good things. Yeah, your hard work, your hard work, your patient endurance. And I was, I was reading, this was in a time when John received this prophecy was when the other apostles were dead. And it seems like it, it wasn't the first church. It was already a second generation of believers um, in, in that church. And it was as if, or they are saying in the commentaries that it, the second generation, when he was saying to them, you don't love me as at first, it's as if they would keep on doing what they were supposed to do or taught by Paul and by John, but they, they didn't have the love for God in the same way that, you know. So what, so, a, what, a, what a, um, yeah. a warning to us, sure. right, that we can actually go on with serving the Lord outwardly, doing the, the right things, right, um, All the works. but not loving, uh, doing works, going into religion uh, without really serving the Lord and loving Him with all our hearts. Yeah, then the, rela the relationship. The relationship. If we do all the right things, but we don't have the relationship, yes. that we have a love relationship with God, that is where we can fail desperately. And, and then, the, you know, John uh, actually says to them, repent, you know, come back to your first love. Do the things that you did at first. Not necessarily the same, um, you know, you can do the same works, but you have to do it with a different heart. 
with the right motivation out of your love for God and your love for other people. And uh, obviously, we all know First Corinthians 13, you know, um, I can I can I can have the faith that move mountains. But if I don't have love, I have, I'm nothing. Um, and God says, I am love. So it's so important that we realize that our faith is not based on works. We're not here to do religious duties. We're here to live in a love relationship with God and love each other fervently because God is love. And without love, our religion actually means nothing. And then he actually says to them here in verse 6, he talks about the Nicolaitans. Um, And it's interesting, the Nicolaitans was a sect uh, during that time. uh, And they believed um, that some sins uh, were not sins because um, they were only prohibited during the law of Moses. And in this instance, it was talking about sexual immorality and other kinds of sins in which the Nicolaitan actually said, no, 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 but if, you know, this fact that we can't sleep around and, you know, do, do whatever we want sexually was actually only prohibited in the law. And Jesus has freed us from the law. So now we no long, long, long have, it, have to obey the law. And so we can actually do these sexual things. Um, and so, um, the Lord is commending them here through the through the letter, saying, "You hate them, I also hate them." Mm-hmm. Um, and and this is this is a question I think we need to ask ourselves: Do we hate the things that God hates? Yeah. Um, do, or do we or do we justify our sin? Right. Because we are no longer under the law; we are free of the law. There is no condemnation. So let's sleep around. But, you know, God loves us, and He will You'll always love us, yeah. us, you know. And this is, this is what the Nicolaitans did. They compromised yeah. what they were doing. They were com- compromising on their faith to do or to, uh, to be active in their sinful desires in the community of Christians. So it's, uh, it's something to think about. No? Yeah, and, and so the Lord... Uh, ends by saying, listen to what I'm saying to you. I want you to repent. And he says, everyone who's victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life. Um, yes. So, you know, that again, like in the, the, in the Garden of Eden, you know, the book of uh, the tree of um, knowledge of good and evil. You know, this is good, this is right, this is wrong. He was saying, that's not what I want you to eat. I want you to eat from the tree of life, which of course is Jesus. Um, I want you to, to give life and be life givers. Like you once were. It's like this church has lost its ability to minister effectively because they were, were busy just with good works, but they've actually renounced the love of Christ they once had. So, so let's go to the next. Um, the next church is uh, the church in Smyrna, and we pick up from verse eight, uh, where where Jesus through Paul is writing this letter. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. Uh, You will suffer for ten days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone who hears, ears to hear, uh, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. I think the the main point standing out here is the suffering, is where he commends them. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. So even if you suffer, and then I couldn't help but think of of 2 Corinthians uh, 1. And I'm going to read that to you, 2 Corinthians 1. It says, verse 3, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is uh, our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. And um, today, how hard is that to teach, actually, that in the church? I mean, I think there's too little teaching about suffering Mm -hmm. and how we should suffer and when we suffer, what um, promises is in suffering and how, when you look at this, that God can use us 
through our sufferings to be a comfort to those who are going through suffering. Isn't it interesting that he says, you will suffer for 10 days. <laughs> so yeah. He's not saying, Thank don't you worry, know. I'm taking you out of the suffering. Uh, like the furnace, Daniel and his friend. Yeah, they had to be thrown in. Uh, you know, John was thrown into the, the, oil. the oil. So sometimes, you know, we yeah. would like to believe that no bad thing will happen to a Christian. But that's actually yeah. not biblical. Okay. We will go through sufferings, like he was saying here. But the Lord says, I want you to remain faithful, sure. um, um, uh, even when facing death. I will give you the crown of life, meaning the, the, the reward you will get yes. through suffering is much bigger than the suffering itself. And so we need to have the same attitude. We're willing to live for Christ. And Paul once say, you know, he said it, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So even if I die for the cause of Christ, I haven't lost anything because my life does not belong to me anymore. I belong to Jesus. It's like in, we will read it later in Revelation 12, but I want to, to just quote it. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, We will overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and the fact that we do not love our lives until death. And I think many of us struggle to get a hold of that truth and saying, I must die to myself, a living sacrifice. So even if I'm alive, I am choosing to die and not to feel and not to hate and not to be angry, you know, and yeah. And to actually have revenge on the people who, who are hurting me. Uh, I'd like to encourage you, if you're going through suffering right now, unfairly, sure. uh, Jesus said, his uh, servants are no greater than their master. And so if they, he suffered unfairly, we will sometimes go through the same uh, situation. Right? So let's go to uh, the church in Pergamum, verse 12. Just get to that. Okay, verse 12. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have rem remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. Now it's very important, we will put a map on for you, that in that city there was four major cults with yes. temples in Pergamum. Yes, you know? and this, this whole thing of the seat of Satan or uh, the throne of Satan actually refers to a very big altar that was erected in honor of Zeus. There was this big yeah. um, temple for Zeus. And so, but the wording uh, that, that Jesus would acknowledge um, that this is where Satan lives. Yeah. I mean, imagine it's not that people were thinking Satan lives there. Yeah. Jesus was saying, yeah. Satan is living in your city. Can you imagine how evil and how bad that must have been for the believers knowing or getting this, this, um, this news? Listen, you are living in the, in the, in the city of Satan, but, but still the Lord honors them for, for remaining loyal and faithful to him. Even though they, they were in a, a very spiritually dark place, um, they were still faithful in serving the Lord among all of these idols and idol worship and all these temples, even to the point where Satan literally was there. It was, it's called the Satan city. Yeah. That's terrible. In verse 14, so it's interesting to know God see the, those who are faithful and then he speaks to those who are not. Mm -hmm. You know, in 14 he says, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teachings is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offers to idols and by committing sexual sin. And it's interesting, you know, this, this uh, passage is in, in the book of Numbers, where it refers back to the book of Numbers where, where uh, Balak was a king who wanted to curse the people of Israel. And he actually paid for Balaam, who was a false prophet, like a witch doctor in today's um, uh, context. And Balak had paid him and said, I'm going to pay you to curse these people. And every day, uh, Balak went out and he couldn't curse. And even though he was an evil person uh, and, he, and he was like a, like a witch doctor, he didn't 
serve God. He couldn't curse the people of Israel. And he and finally said to Balak, I can't curse that which God has blessed. But then interestingly enough, he actually told Balak, if you want to actually get to them, you need to get them to sin. So I can't curse them, but they can actually curse themselves. They can actually put themselves in harm way yeah. and open them up for punishment and for evil if you can get them to do evil. And Balak's mm -hmm. strategy was very easy. He actually sent the women uh, from these yeah. other Midianites and the, and the Moabites. He sent these women into the camp. And these men of Israel began to sleep with these women. But the worst of it, these women began to tell them, why don't you come to worship uh, my, in my temple, my idol? Yeah. And so um, it's actually a very slew strategy that the enemy used to get the people of God into sin. And so that's why we need to be so careful. Some things can, can look so enticing and yeah. can look so uh, innocent, right? What are, you know, I, I'm making friends with this person, but that's this person might lead me to do evil. So it's not wrong to have the friend, but I need to be careful how I make friends, how I open myself up to these people so that they can begin to influence me to serve other things. And so it's rather the other way around. I need to make friends for the purpose of winning them for Christ and not for them actually um, enticing me to, de to do sexual things. And so he was saying, you're tolerating this. You're tolerating a double standard. You know, you, you want to live for me, you're faithful, but only, and you know, you do secretly, um, you make agreements uh, with the evil one by doing things that's not pleasing to me. And in 15, it's interesting, like with Ephes, uh, Ephesians, he was saying, in a similar way, you have some Nicol Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teachings, again, the sexual sin of the Nicolaitans. So it's now in, Ephes, in Ephesus and in, in um in Pergamum, it's the same thing. They're repeating the same um, sin, you know. And then in verse 16, it says, Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And it was interesting when he came to, to this church. He said, I'm coming with you, the mm -hmm. one with the sword in my mouth. He's saying to you, if you do not repent, I will cut you. Yeah, yeah, because he, you know, it's it's beautiful how the Lord says it, right? He says, I'm fighting against the evil in your city, but you have to repent because if you don't repent, I will actually end up fighting against you. If you side with the enemy, if you don't say, I'm not with them, I'm not going to partake of evil, I actually belong to the Lord, then you will be spared. But if you side with the with the evil one, um, and with the evil doing that's going on in the city, you will actually have God fighting against you. Wouldn't that be terrible? The Lord yeah, saying, I'm coming to fight against yeah, you, yeah, not just yeah, yeah. evil, but because you refuse to repent. I'm actually fighting with, to, against you with the sword of my mouth. And then he ends uh, verse 17 uh, yes. by saying, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious meaning you have overcome this, you are not doing this sexual sin. You are not tolerating, tolerating idolatry. You are not doing this. You are not buying idols around yeah. you that's from the shops, you know. Mm -hmm. that. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone. And on the stone will be engraved a new name. That no one understands except the one who receives it. Uh, this is such a beautiful passage, and I remember um, in the in the in the prophets as well. The Lord was talking about this secrets that He wants to share with us as believers, as His beloved. Right? Um, he, God wants to show us hidden things. Um, God wants to have a kind of relationship with us where He can share His heart with us. And this is a picture of that. The Lord says, if you would. Just separate yourself. You know, holiness means to be separate, to be different. Um, if you're just willing to listen to what I'm saying to you, move away from the compromise. Move away from justifying your sin. Move away from, from, from tolerating things that shouldn't be tolerated. I will give you, I will have a secret relationship with you. 
in which I'll give you hidden matter, meaning the Lord will share things with you He doesn't share with other people. Yes, revelations. Right, yes. revelations, like it, yeah. you know, in the in the in the desert manner every morning. So the Lord will share new things with us, and then He says, "I will give Him a white stone." With 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 a new name, I mean, then we enter we, we enter into the into the same category as people like Abram, yeah. whose name was changed, or Jacob, yeah. whose name was changed, or Sarah's name which was changed. I was saying, I'm going to give you a new name. Yeah. Is that beautiful? It's like a new covenant the Lord makes with us very specifically, yeah. um, and it's beautiful how the Lord says to this church, "You can be my special possession if you're willing to walk away." from this, this compromise uh, that you're doing. And then um, uh, the last, uh, the third city that he writes to is the city, oh, no, this is the fourth one already, right? Yeah. The, the fourth city is the, the church in Thyatira, or Thyatira, or however you want to pronounce it. And so uh, the, uh, John writes, write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. Uh, sorry, I'm, I want to say something. It's amazing uh, when I looked at this and I saw the different kind of how God is representing himself in that letter. In the first one, he said to, to uh, Ephesus, he says, is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the golden land. The second one, he says, it's the message from the one who is the first and the last. Mm -hmm. To Pergamum, he said, um, it is the one with the two-edged sword in his mouth. And now he's saying to this church, I am the one with the fire in my eyes and the one with the feet of war. You know? So it's interesting how God is presenting in himself, himself in yeah. a different way to yeah. each one of these yeah. churches. Um, them having a different... Um, revelation or, or, or encounter with him in a, in a different way. And, and then he says to them, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this a complaint against you. It's interesting how every time he commends them, but he also says there's still things you need to work on. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, who, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering. And those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Yes, um, very important here, the, the different attack in this, mm. in this church. Yes. In, the other, in the other churches, in the other cities, the sexual attacks from the Nicolaitans and then this from Belium and Bolak sending the women from other tribes and peoples was from outsiders. It was almost Christian men who fell for unbelievers and, and mm -hmm. women who enticed them. This church is very powerful. If you understand this, this is a woman in this church. This is a woman operating as prophet as somebody who mm -hmm. hears from God wow. but she leads the people men in this church to do sexual sin so it will be a woman that is married twice or three times or um or not even married but sleeping around but she has a leadership role so we need to see this and mm. see how why God is coming with his eyes like fire and his feet like uh, you know shining bronze it's 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 incredible to think you know, when you say that you know how dangerous it is to permit things. Um, you know what's very evident in this whole chapter we've read so far is that the Lord is calling us to live differently, yeah. to not compromise on our faith, and to call sin sin. If something is wrong, we need to say it's wrong. Um, because the the end of this church is 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 very sad, and we'll we'll read about it now. Just now, he says in verse twenty four, I also have a message to the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. 
deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan actually, I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey to the very end, to them I will give authority over the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I receive from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Yesterday we read that scripture in Psalm 2 verse yes, 8, yes. and I am going to read it again because this, this is very powerful because it's the same scripture. It says, Ask of me the nations... And I will give it to you as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. Now you must remember, this is what he is saying here to that church. He says to the church, if you overcome this, if you overcome the sexual immorality, standing against manipulation, standing against sin, sexual sin in the church from people in the church mm -hmm. i will give you the same authority that i gave jesus wow. in psalm 8 because this was written as what jesus had and he says you will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots just as we read in in um in the city it says now then you kings act wisely be warned you rulers of the earth Remember, we are kings and priests. We are a royal nation, a royal priesthood called by God. Yes. But the moment when we are captured and trapped in the wrong relationships and doing the wrong things, we will fall. And, and it is actually interesting that when you um, go back to those nations today, I mean, we, we told you yesterday, yeah. um, this, these seven churches it's were in the region which is today modern-day Turkey. Western. And you go to, to to Western Turkey today, and even the whole of Turkey, yeah. Yeah. and you no longer see these churches operating. Um, they lost their faith. It's not like, for example, in Ethiopia or in Egypt or in other places where the church has been going on since the time of Jesus. Um, you know, they might not be as strong, but they're still going strong. Today, you don't have that anymore in Turkey. And that is because I we, we, we suspect that they didn't repent. They didn't want to serve God the way He wanted um, Him uh, wanted to serve. Oh, okay. he, yeah. he wanted to serve them, um, um, serve Him, and so they um, they didn't have that authority anymore. And so it's so important to understand that whenever we compromise, we lose our spiritual authority. And the more we live the way that God wants us to live, the more we gain spiritual authority. I mean, He says, "I'm giving you the same authority." Uh, they will have the same authority I received from my Father. I mean, imagine mm -hmm. they, will, they will act like Jesus in the earth. They would have an opportunity not just to effect change there, but in the whole region. Now, it's interesting, as I told you in the beginning, uh, you know, some of these cities like Ephesus had that authority. They changed the whole region. They changed mm -hmm. idol worship, right? So, so that is God's idea for every city, for every church in the city like here in Buenos Aires wherever you are in your city God wants the church of that city to be so victorious that they would effect change not only over their city but over their region over their nation and over the nations there's no limit to how God can use us if we're willing to pay the price uh, for him to use us sure. um, um, in this whole process of reading about this and the authority of the nations, I came on this in Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah was a young person. And I believe this is a word for the young people. And I, I want you to hear what God is saying to the churches. And the same way that these churches lost their authority in their, God removed their lampstands. This is the same word that God is sharing with us. I mean, that was powerful service. And I want to challenge the young people to hear what God is saying. For example, Jeremiah 1, he says, from verse 4, he says, The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nation. O sovereign Lord, I said, I cannot speak unto young. 
The Lord replied, Don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. And it's easy for us to look at this and say, yes, with the authority that Christ has given us and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if we struggle with this sins mm -hmm. in our lives, we yes. are disqualifying ourselves. Yes. We are, we are nullifying the word of God, which is ours. And he's giving it to us and he's saying, I am making you. I will just say authority that I gave Jesus Christ over the nations. I am giving it to you. If you overcome, we'd like to give you this challenge today as we read through this chapter that you would examine your own life, that you would let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what are the things that you need to get rid of, areas of compromise. Maybe it could be idols, other gods, other things, statues, things in your life um, that you've permitted, that you've justified as, as being right. Uh, maybe there are some relationships that have led you astray yes. and you need to correct those relationships and put some boundaries there and be a blessing to those people instead of them enticing you to do the things that is not pleasing to God. It's so important that we examine our lives as he's asking them to do. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. And so I'd like to invite you the same today as we read through these churches. Unfortunately, they're no long, longer around. They, they, they're no longer effective um, in the region where they were. And, and it's because they've lost their authority. And, and the Lord is asking of us not, he's warning us. We I can learn want, from them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we can learn from their mistakes. We can grow in authority instead of losing our authority yes. by making sure we do what the Lord is expecting us to do. Let's pray together. Yes. Father, we thank you so much that you are in the business of using us and and correcting us thank you that you come today with your word to speak against us like that sword uh, in your mouth saying i want you to repent i want you to to fix the things that you need to fix i want you to no longer live the way you've lived and compromise and justifying sin help us lord to get rid and repent of whatever it is that does not please you Help us, Lord, to take up the authority that you've given us, um, even over the nations. And help us to be a blessing, uh, and help us to be effective, help us to learn from these churches who long ago made such a huge impact, but today are no longer there, and we don't want to go the same. We want to have a life that leaves a legacy that's eternal, and that will improve and grow from generation to generation. Thank you, Lord, that you guide us. Thank you for this time together in your word. Thank you that you keep on speaking us through your spirit. In Jesus' name. Yes, Amen. Father, and, and we pray that we will be the church that you want us to be, that this our church and who we are, because we are your church personally, and we are together as a family or church. And we pray that we will be, long after we have gone to be with you, that the church will be strong and healthy and vibrant and doing what God has called her to do. In the name of Jesus, make us strong to make the right choices so that you will not come and remove a lampstand from the city. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today again. And tomorrow we'll see you again. Same time, same, same place as we go through uh, Revelations chapter 3. God bless you.